Good morning, gardeners, and welcome to Monday, June 26th. My name is Catherine, and I created a show called Good Morning Gardeners, even though I can't grow green things, because I am referring to gardening metaphorically. We're planting the seeds for a better day. We're starting our morning by getting in the right mindset to cultivate a better life for ourselves, better communities, and a better world. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you'd like to add Good Morning Gardeners to your morning routine. I do my best to wake you up with positive and mentally stimulating ideas, but sometimes I miss things. If you have something to add to the ideas I discussed today, please chime in in the comments section below. Today is the International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. The world drug problem is a complex issue that affects millions of people worldwide. Many people who use drugs face stigma and discrimination, which can further harm their physical and mental health and prevent them from accessing the help they need. The International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking, or World Drug Day, is marked on 26 June every year to strengthen action and cooperation in achieving a world world free of drug abuse. The aim of this year's campaign is to raise awareness about the importance of treating people who use drugs with respect and empathy, providing evidence-based voluntary services for all, offering alternatives to punishment, prioritizing prevention, and leading with compassion. The campaign also aims to combat stigma and discrimination against people who use drugs by promoting language and attitudes that are respectful and non-judgmental. So today is Monday for you, but it's actually Friday for me. And what this means is that I have been waking up for five days in a row and listening to myself speak um, for five days in a row. And honestly, I, I get tired of it sometimes. You know, do you ever get sick of listening to your own voice? Well, I definitely do. Um, so usually for me on Mondays, I don't feel that bad. I usually feel refreshed and ready to, to get at it again, but Friday mornings, ironically, I know that's unusual, Friday mornings can be tough for me because, I mean, especially since I started doing Good Morning Gardeners because I'm like, man, day after day, just the sound of my voice. I mean, I don't know. Um, but I do know that Mondays are tough for most people, especially if you have a nine to five, which is totally, totally, totally understandable. And by the way, I am on board with the four-day work week. Um, I'm just not living it yet. But anyway, in light of this, in light of the, you know, just dull, boring drudgery <laughs> that the day-to-day -day monotony that can be that come that can come from working towards your goals, um, this morning's episode is dedicated to convincing you, convincing myself, convincing all of us to keep going, even when we are bored out of our minds and it feels like we are banging our heads against a wall. I'm going to start by reading an article by James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, about the Helsinki bus station theory. If you haven't already read Atomic Habits, I highly recommend it. I will link it down below. And if you haven't heard of the Helsinki bus station theory, great, because you're about to learn all about it. So James Clear writes, in June of 2004, Arno Raphael Minkinen stepped up to the microphone at the New England School of Photography to deliver the commencement speech. As he looked out at the graduating students, Minkinen shared a simple theory that, in his estimation, made all the difference between success and failure. He called it the Helsinki bus station theory. Minkinen was born in Helsinki, Finland. In the center of the city, there was a large bus station, and he began his speech by describing it to the students. Some two dozen platforms are laid out in a square at the heart of the city. At the head of each platform is a sign posting the numbers of the buses that leave from that particular platform. The bus numbers might read 21, 71, 58, 33, and 19. Each bus takes the same route out of the city for at least a kilometer, stopping at bus stop intervals along the way. Now, let's say, again, metaphorically speaking, that each bus stop represents one year in the life of a photographer, meaning the third bus stop would represent three years of photographic activity. Okay, so you have been working for three years making platinum studies of nudes, call it bus number 21. 
You take those three years of work to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and the curator asks you if you are familiar with the nudes of Irving Penn. His bus, 71, was on the same line. Or you take them to a gallery in Paris, and are reminded to check out Bill Brandt, bus number 58, and so on. Shocked, you realize that what you have been doing for three years, others have already done. So you hop off the bus, grab a cab, because life is short, and head straight back to the bus station looking for another platform. This time, you are going to make 8x10 view camera color snapshots of people lying on the beach from a cherry picker crane. You spend three years at it, and three grand, and produce a series of works that elicit the same comment. Haven't you seen the work of Richard Miesrock? Or if they are steamy black and white 8x10s of palm trees swaying off a beachfront, haven't you seen the work of Sally Mann? So once again, you get off the bus, grab a cab, race back and forth to find a new platform. This goes on all your creative life, always showing new work and always being compared to others. Minkinen paused. He looked out at the students and asked, what to do? It's simple, he said, stay on the bus. Stay on the fucking bus, because if you do, this time you will begin to see a difference. The buses that move out of Helsinki stay on the same line, but only for a while, maybe a kilometer or two. Then they begin to separate, each number heading off to its own unique destination. Bus 33 suddenly goes north, bus 19 southwest. For a time, maybe 21 and 71 dovetail one another, but soon they split off as well. Irving Penn is headed elsewhere. It's the separation that makes all the difference, Minkinen said, and once you start to see the difference in your work from the work you so admire, it's time to look for your breakthrough. Suddenly your work starts to get noticed. Now you are working more on your own, making more of the difference between your work and what influenced it. Your vision takes off. And as the years mount up and your work begins to pile up, it won't be long before the critics become very intrigued, not just by what separates your work from a Sally Mann or a Ralph Gibson, but by what you did when you first got started. You regain the whole bus route, in fact. The vintage prints made 20 years ago are suddenly reevaluated, and for what it's worth, start selling at a premium. At the end of the line, where the bus comes to rest and the driver can get out for a smoke or better yet a cup of coffee, that's when the work is done. It could be the end of your career as an artist, or the end of your life for that matter, but your total output is now all there before you. The early so-called imitations, the breakthroughs, the peaks and the valleys, the closing masterpieces, all with the stamp of your unique vision. Why? Because you stayed on the bus. I write frequently about how mastery requires consistency. That includes ideas like putting in your reps, improving your average speed, and falling in love with boredom. These ideas are critical, but the Helsinki bus station theory helps to clarify and distinguish some important details that often get overlooked. Consider a college student. They have likely spent more than 10,000 hours in a classroom by this point in their life. Are they an expert at learning every piece of information thrown at them? Not at all. Most of what we hear in class is forgotten shortly thereafter. Consider someone who works on a computer each day at work. If you've been in your job for years, it's very likely that you have spent more than 10,000 hours writing and responding to emails. Given all of this writing, do you have the skills to write the next great novel? Probably not. Consider the average person who goes to the gym each week. Many folks have been doing this for years or even decades. Are they built like elite athletes? Do they possess elite level strength? Unlikely. The key feature of the Helsinki bus station theory is that it urges you to not simply do more key work, but more rework. Average college students learn ideas once. The best college students relearn ideas over and over. Average employees write emails once. Elite novelists rewrite chapters again and again. Average fitness enthusiasts mainly follow the same workout routine each week. The best athletes actively critique each repetition and constantly improve their technique. It's the revision that matters most. To continue the bus metaphor, the photographer who gets off the bus after a few stops and then hops on a new bus line is still doing work the whole time. 
They are putting in their 10,000 hours. What they are not doing, however, is rework. They are so busy jumping from line to line in the hopes of finding a route that nobody has ridden before that they do not invest the time to rework their old ideas. And this, as the Helsinki bus station theory makes clear, is the key to producing something unique and wonderful. By staying on the bus, you give yourself time to rework and revise until you produce something unique, inspiring, and great. It's only by staying on board that mastery reveals itself. Show up enough times to get the average ideas out of the way, and every now and then, genius will reveal itself. Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, popularized uh, the 10,000 hour rule, which states that it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert in a particular field. I think that what we often miss is that deliberate practice is revision. If you're not paying close enough attention to revise, then you're not being deliberate. A lot of people put in 10,000 hours. Very few people put in 10,000 hours of revision. The only way to do that is to stay on the bus. So which bus will you ride? We are all creators in some capacity. The manager who fights for a new initiative, the accountant who creates a faster process for managing tax returns, the nurse who thinks up a better way of managing her patients, and of course, the writer, the designer, the painter, the musician, laboring to share their work out to the world. They are all creators. Any creator who tries to move society forward will experience failure. Too often, we respond to these failures by calling a cab and getting on another bus line. Maybe the ride will be smoother over there. Instead, we should stay on the bus and commit to the hard work of revisiting, rethinking, and revising our ideas. In order to do that, however, you must answer the toughest question of all. Which bus will you ride? What story do you want to tell with your life? What craft do you want to spend your years revising and improving? How do you know the right answer? You don't. Nobody knows the best bus, but if you want to fulfill your potential, you must choose one. This is one of the central tensions of life. It's your choice, but you must choose. And once you do, stay on the bus. So if you are still trying to decide which bus to get on, I recommend that you check out the video I posted two videos ago, um, and I'll link it in the comments. Um, no one can tell you which bus to get on, and I think it's probably impossible to develop a one-size-fits-all step-by-step guide to making this decision. But I do hope that the video I posted, um, which is the How to Find Meaning and Build a Legacy episode of Good Morning Gardeners, can help you make your own way toward getting on the right bus. So let me know if you guys like the Helsinki bus station theory. I love it, and when I think of it, I always get a little jolt of motivation, no matter how discouraged I'm feeling. But that actually wasn't our feel-good moment for today. Just in case you still aren't feeling motivated and want to crawl back in bed or quit your job or let the weeds take over your garden, I'm hoping our feel-good moment will inspire you to keep going. I'm going to read from yet another James Clear article because in this one, James shares five useful reminders for what to do when you feel like giving up. I'm sorry, five useful reminders, just things to remember when you feel like giving up. This article is titled, What I Do When I Feel Like Giving Up. So James writes, I am struggling today. If you ever struggle to be consistent with something you care about, maybe my struggle will resonate with you too. It has been 939 days since November 12, 2012. That's the date when I first published an article on jamesclear.com, and it's almost two years and seven months ago. During these 939 most mostly glorious, sometimes frustrating days, I have written a new post every Monday and Thursday, week after week, month after month, year after year. But today, well, today I am struggling. Today, I don't feel like writing. Today, I don't feel like sticking to the routine. Today, I don't feel like I have any great ideas and I don't feel like I have enough time to make good ideas great. Today, I feel like giving up. Research from the University of Pennsylvania has shown that grit is the characteristic linked most closely to success. I could use some grit today. Here's what I try to remind myself when I feel like giving up. First, your mind is a suggestion engine. Consider everything you thought 
I'm sorry, consider every thought you have as a suggestion, not an order. Right now, my mind is suggesting that I feel tired. It's suggesting that I give up. It is suggesting that I take an easier path. If I pause for a moment, however, I can discover new suggestions. My mind is also suggesting that I will still feel good about accomplishing this work once it is done. It is suggesting that I will respect the identity I am building when I stick to the schedule. It is suggesting that I have the ability to finish this task even when I don't feel like it. Remember, none of these suggestions are orders. They are merely options. I have the power to choose which option I follow. Number two, discomfort is temporary. Relative to the time in your normal day or week, nearly any habit you perform is over quickly. Your workout will be finished in an hour or two. Your report will be typed up to completion by tomorrow morning. This article will be finished in just a moment. Life is easier now than it has ever been. 300 years ago, if you didn't kill your own food and build your own house, you would die. Today, we whine about forgetting our iPhone charger. Maintain perspective. Your life is good and your discomfort is temporary. Step into this moment of discomfort and let it strengthen you. Number three, you will never regret good work once it is done. Theodore Roosevelt famously said, find, Theodore Roosevelt famously said, far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. So often it seems that we want to work easily at work worth doing. We want our work to be helpful and respected, but we do not want to struggle through our work. We want our stomachs to be flat and our arms to be strong, but we do not want to grind through another workout. We want the final result, but not the failed attempts that precede it. We want the gold, but not the grind. Anyone can want a gold medal. Few people want to train like an Olympian. And yet, despite our resistance to it, I have never found myself feeling worse after the hard work was done. There have been days when it was damn hard to start, but it was always worth finishing. Sometimes the simple act of showing up and having the courage to do, to do the work, even in an average manner, is a victory worth celebrating. Number four, this is life. Life is a constant balance between giving up to the ease of distraction or overcoming the pain of discipline. It's not an exaggeration to say that our lives and our identities are defined in this delicate balance. What is life if not the sum of a hundred thousand daily battles and tiny decisions to either gut it out or give it up? This moment when you don't feel like doing the work, this is not a moment to be thrown away. This is not a dress rehearsal. This moment is your life as much as any other moment. Spend it in a way that will make you proud. Number five, let the world decide. So what do I do when I feel like giving up? I show up. Do I show up at my best? I doubt it, but my job isn't to judge how good or bad I am. My job is to do the work and let the world decide. So for our focus moment today, I want you to think about what it is that you really want. It can be just about anything, as long as it's something that you dream of. Uh, examples include a, a big beautiful house, a garden full of puppies, a million Instagram followers, your own bookshop, or just the freedom to travel the globe. Choose the thing the one thing that would make you the happiest you think it's possible for any person to be. Choose your own personal dream. For James Clear, I think his dream would have been to be a successful author, a household name with a New York Times bestseller that has sold over 15 million copies. Now, remember, this last article that I read to you when he was struggling was written in 2015, and he had already been writing blog posts on that website for nearly three years at that point since he started in 2012. Atomic Habits wasn't published in 2018, five years after he started his blog. In 2019, it had sold over a million copies. By 2021, it had sold over three million copies. And today, jamesclear.com proudly proclaims that Atomic Habits has sold over 15 million copies worldwide. So in my example, James Clear didn't have his dream scenario come true until 11 years after he started working towards it. Of course, 
I don't know what his actual goal was. I'm not sure, or I'm not sure if he, you know, had in mind a specific number of copies sold, or if he simply wanted to publish a book, or maybe he had something else in mind. But uh, as a thought experiment, we can say that his dream was to sell one million copies of a book. And if that was true, then we could say his dream came true seven years after he started writing blog posts on James Clear. And remember that James Clear wasn't simply phoning it in for those seven years. He is like an Olympic gold medalist of achieving goals. For those entire seven years, and probably for a very long time before them, he strived to become 1% better every single day. He was constantly and consistently analyzing his work and optimizing to see how he can improve even the tiniest little details. So for our focus moment, I just want you to think about your own journey. How long have you been working toward your goal? And have you been striving to get 1% better every single day during that time? Speaking for myself, I decided to launch my own graphic design agency aimed at making the world a better place in 2020. So I have been working toward mine for three years and I have absolutely not been diligent every single day since then. There have been many days when I couldn't bring myself to do anything to advance this goal, let alone ask myself if I was performing 1% better that day. So if you are anything like me, I'm guessing you also fall short of the James Clear shining example. And that's okay, because we are human. I'm not suggesting that we should expect ourselves to be perfect every day. I'm only suggesting that the James Clear example proves that we should keep going. Especially since, for most of us mortals, we have to take days and sometimes weeks off. And that is probably going to extend the number of years it will take for us to achieve our goals. The main thing is that we don't give up. It's okay to pause, it's okay to take breaks, but we have to keep going. I'll stay on my bus if you stay on yours. I hope you found this helpful and I hope you have a wonderful day. I will speak with you again tomorrow.